Welcome to the first Centering Servingness webinar of the year and welcome to National HSI Week. We know that we're also kicking off um, uh, Hispanic Heritage Month and a number of um, Independence Days. And so thank you for joining us on this very special week and very special day. For those of you who have been regular webinar participants, thank you for sticking with us as we embark on our third year of the series. And for those of you who are new to the webinar, we're so grateful that you've chosen to join us today. On behalf of Faculty Affairs and HSI Initiatives at the University of Arizona, we're glad that you've chosen to spend the next hour with us. I'm Judy marquez Kiyama, and I serve as the Associate Vice Provost for Faculty Development. We begin by respectfully acknowledging that the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes, with Tucson being home to the Orem and the Yaqui. Committed to diversity and inclusion, the university strives to build sustainable relationships with sovereign native nations and indigenous communities through education offerings, partnerships, and community service. Dr. Gina Garcia's extensive body of work on the concept of servingness helps us to inform this webinar series which features faculty and staff who engage in scholarship and servingness efforts that honor the cultures and lived experiences of that next Black, Indigenous, and underrepresented students and communities. And as I've shared before, our goal of the series is threefold. We want to spotlight current scholarship, offering examples of the rich ways in which servingness is enacted by faculty and staff across the institution. We want to learn together about how to engage in these efforts and we want to build knowledge. And we address the question each week, what next steps are needed to build institutional capacity around HSI servingness? What I'll do is share the link with you um, where we keep our webinar series so that you have access to the last two years, all of which are recorded. And we'll share that recording with you. Um, we will also record today's session. Um, so it'll be accessible to you after we get that up on the website. Our speaker today is Dr. Ulysses Rakoy. Associate Research Scientist in the Department of Neuroscience. Dr. Rakoy's earlier research focused on neural anatomical substrates of drug reward and cellular mechanisms underlying presynaptic inhibition on central synapse dynamics. It's a mouthful. <laughs> he works to understand how neurons encode and compute information, which is fundamental in, brain, in the brain, and combines that with hands-on experiences with such techniques on live neurons. For the past decade, he has used formal training to explore low cost and hands-on approaches in neuroscience to explore behavioral and physiological questions, learning to memory, locomotor, act, local motor activity, drug seeking and drug reward with undergraduate students. He is committed to broadening access in neuroscience with historically underserved populations via low cost approaches. We invited Dr. Rukoy to speak as a panelist during our Culturally Responsive Curriculum Development Institute with faculty this June, and we were blown away by the ways in which he approaches his research and teaching from a serving -less, serving this lens, from a culturally responsive lens, and from one that cultivates inclusive opportunities for students. I am so excited and so grateful that you've joined us today. Please help me welcome Dr. Ulysses Rukoy. Thank you. Now, okay, I want to share my screen. That was a very nice presentation introduction. All righty. Um, so thank you so much uh, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm really uh, honored, to be honest. Uh, it's hard not to be emotional on today. If you are uh, Mexican descent, if you're Latino, uh, this day in, in the entire continent represents a very important date. Uh, so I really want to acknowledge that. Um, so Feliz Día de la Independencia, uh, Viva Mexico, y el resto de Latinoamérica. Uh, the title of my talk, uh, actually, is a title that uh, you may be surprised, but it's taken me close to 12, 13 years to really uh, be able to tell you in one sentence, what is that I do? What is it that I do? You know, um, typically I have said many things. You know, I, I like to talk a lot. Many of you have known me in person. 
Uh, and sometimes it's hard for me to articulate in a clear, concise manner when people ask me, well, what do you do? And looking back, uh, I think that a lot of the experiences that I've had that have nothing to do with neuroscience in terms of diversity, in terms of inclusion, in terms of uh, acknowledging who I am as a person. And really what is, as I understand it from my daughter, uh, this intersectionality of, of my identity. So I, I'll start out with that. I identify myself today uh, as a Mexican-American scientist, uh, Chicano. You know, I use pronouns, uh, él, his, him. Uh, and to me, that's important. It, it's really a way to relate to a lot of people, uh, young people, in ways that I didn't grow up with. Uh, so I'll be talking about cultural responsive mentoring and what, what that means to me. What, what do I mean by that? And the way, as a neuroscientist, it, it's really a vehicle uh, utilizing neuroscience and, and my formal training in neuroscience and my informal education in neuroscience, ultimately with my passion, which is undergraduate education, undergraduate students, especially in areas that are marginalized, whether it's uh, inner city environment, like the one that I grew up in Mexico City, uh, or whether that is a rural area, uh, like for example, where I worked in Española, New Mexico, which is literally like a second home, so a big shout out to Española. Um, the images that I'm showing you here, are, are images that I normally would have never put on a presentation of neuroscience. And so the title of this presentation, which is Culturally Responsive Mentoring, it's it sort of, I have been invited by many individuals to bring my entire self to the lab, to the campus, just the way that I see myself, just the way that I am. And oftentimes I've not done that in the past. I, I was not even aware that I was doing that, uh, but it's taken uh, probably uh, I can share uh, uh, off offline uh, more personal anecdotes as to how that came about. But the image on the left here is actually a very famous book in the field of Chicano psychology. And this is actually, it's an honor for me to say that uh, Dr. Joe Martinez uh, is a person that completely changed my life as an undergraduate student as a doctoral student at the University of Texas in San Antonio where I met him and gave me an opportunity. Perhaps I did not deserve the opportunity on paper. Perhaps I had not had a full accolade like some of the other students that he had mentored at UC Berkeley where he was before. But he himself went to San Antonio because in his mind, uh, he embodied what servicelessness is. And I'll talk about that. The image on the right, it's, uh, well, uh, that's, that's me uh, in a rig, an electrophysiology rig uh, in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, uh, the Marine Biological Laboratory, where I actually applied as a student uh, when I was chair, when I was dean at Northern New Mexico College. And I actually was accepted. And uh, I took the recommendation and I didn't go because uh, the recommendation that came from some heavy hitters in that field said, we want you to focus in, in what you're doing. You know, you're opening a path. So as, as hard as that was, I didn't go, but nevertheless, uh, I, I get to go now as a faculty member, which for me sometimes is when I hear myself say this out loud, I cannot believe that that's actually myself. The image on the right is actually a gift um, from Anita. And so uh, I really appreciate that, but that's actually a depiction of me running. I love to trail run in the mountains. I love art, I love tattoos, uh, and so that's, that's supposed to be me, okay? And most importantly, this identity aspect that I can bring myself entirely to the lab, to the campus, I can be myself. And this title that I'm sharing with you, it's a title that's taken me years in the making to be able to accept myself the way that I am just for right now, just for right here. And to be okay with that, even though I'm nervous, even though I'm scared, what my colleagues may think. Wait a minute, what do you mean you're showing all of this? This is supposed to be a neuroscience talk. So the philosophy of my approach in science is really to share, to learn from each other in the form of a community. I have learned this from many individuals that I consider mentors, indigenous individuals, 
in Mexico, in the Southern Plains, the Northern Plains. Um, I try to practice humble activities. Uh, I'm a very passionate individual and I really like to lift others. I'm a type of person that when I see that, I hear that somebody's doing good, it really makes me happy inside. I almost get emotional when I talk about it, but it's the truth. And we all have a story. We all do. My vision is very straightforward. It's really to provide my own experiences, to provide my own training that I have done. Some of it has been here at this university. You know, I, I tell people just, just because I am a Chicano, that doesn't mean that I can mentor Chicanos. I need training in that. I need to listen better. Many of you that know me personally would agree with that statement. So to provide these culturally relevant opportunities uh, that are not just academic in nature, and by academic, I mean in a classroom with the students that I teach now in the fall semester, where there is a gen ed course, where there is a students in the lab that are involved in research projects or research credits, but also uh, non-academically. And sometimes I think that that's more profound. My ability to identify with somebody, my ability to trust a scientist, my ability to know and internally feel that I am a science person, that I am a science people, that I come from a lineage of cultural science and to embody that, to humbly and proudly walk straight, looking at the sky, looking at you in the eye. That's what I mean, confidence, project ownership, sense of belonging. All of those things in my mind precede engagement and much, much more precede retention. The mechanisms which I do is uh, I work with equipment. I have one right here, right here. This is a, a research grade amplifier that has a sticker. I'm very, very happy that the Grass Foundation, which I give a shout out to, have supported my work. Uh, we have collaborated with uh, companies that are really uh, designed not for profit. They are for profit, but they're designed really to provide access to individuals like back their brains. Right. And so very, very happy that we can collaborate. It takes a it takes a team. It's not just me. But the idea here is that low cost culturally, where I'm from, does not mean that this is poor quality. It means that you have an opportunity where otherwise you did not have before. And even this has taken me years to understand. I used to use the term low cost, even the hashtag. I don't use that anymore. I mean, I still do, but not as much. And the main reason for that is because a lot of the individuals that I communicate, stakeholders, if you will, federally funded programs, NSF, NIH, scientists, other institutions, when low cost is thrown around or when they see equipment that's even of poor quality, uh, immediately the, the mind goes to, oh, well, that must be low quality. And in my mind, the science is not about the tools that we have, but about the questions that we're asking. And the other thing that I would mention is that community wealth is extremely important. This is a concept that I did not coin. I'm gonna talk about this today. So what does it mean to be an HSI? What does it mean to be a Hispanic serving institution? And at the same time, be a research intensive institution? What does that mean? What does the concept of inclusive diversity mean? These are questions that keep me up at night. I think about this all the time when I'm riding my bike, when I'm running, when I'm exercising, when I'm praying, when I'm meditating. To me, servingness, that's actually why I'm here. I'm here to serve. I believe that my creator has a purpose for me, and that is to be of maximum service. So the idea of servingness in the concept of a Hispanic serving institution, as, as, as Judy earlier mentioned in the introduction, uh, it, it's a concept that uh, was sort of referred to in, in, by Garcia Núñez and Sanson 
in 2019. And, and so what does it mean? It means really uh, to serve, not just to enroll students of Latinx background, perhaps. So not just to accumulate numbers of students, but to actually serve them, right? But what, what, what does that mean? How, how, do, how does one serve students? You know, even within the Hispanic Latinx population, uh, if you will, uh, even the diversity among these groups is very vast, makes it difficult to define, makes it difficult to, to have a one solution for all. This is work by Gina Garcia, right? Uh, but not only that, uh, in my field, in, in science, uh, we know uh, there's a lot of people that have been looking at this kind of work. Uh, David Asai is one of the lead individuals that has led this discussion for the last decade. And uh, in his work, he would say that despite unprecedented demand and high interest uh, of marginalized, excluded individuals, he would argue, excluded, there's a difference, who belong to particular racial groups, ethnic groups, they're leaving science at unacceptable rates. He would argue, I would agree, that fixing the student approach, in other words, a deficit-based intervention, which by the way, I have benefited extensively by interventions of all sorts. Let's talk about science. Deficit. Oh, I, I, I don't know chemistry. I, I don't know math. There's, there's a, 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 on this campus, I'm sure there's individuals that would agree that uh, there's a number of students that shouldn't be on campus because they're not quote unquote college ready. So there's a number of programs that are designed to quote unquote fix the student. I have benefited myself from many of them, actually. Not putting them down, but at the same time, I would also argue when you look at the data that that's not sufficient. And in fact, when you look at the data, it's unacceptable, unacceptable. And so it's really more about changing the cultural science, redefining what inclusive scholarship is, what inclusive diversity is. So what does that mean for me? And I saw this beautiful Instagram post by uh, the, the Escala, Escala Educator Consulting, uh, who, who I know personally, uh, Melissa Salazar. Uh, I met in Española, New Mexico. Uh, very, very proud uh, of their work uh, within the Hispanic and colleges universities. Uh, and I saw this Instagram and I loved it. And I said, I have to share this with it. And, and that is that, what do we mean by cultural wealth? Right, so this idea of ventajas, this word that Melissa coined uh, in this Instagram post, you know, what does that mean, a ventaja? You know, what does cultural wealth mean? We're talking about that community cultural wealth, for instance, as a Chicano, as an immigrant that I identify all of these aspects of intersectionality. It's an array of knowledge, skills, abilities, uh, the network, my contacts, for the most part, communities of color, people of color, BIPOC individuals have survived and have resisted micro and macro forms of oppression and aggression. I'm not gonna share with you some of the experiences that I have experienced on this campus when, when people look at me physically. And you could just imagine uh, some of the thoughts that come to mind. And when I say that I'm a professor, oftentimes I hear, yeah, right. Uh, so uh, I would like to offer you what uh, Melissa Salazar to Escala said in the Instagram post, which is a deficit language could be that, oh, wait a minute. This student has too many obligations, too many commitments, not focused, distracted. That could be considered a barrier. In the, man, in the lens of many individuals. The lens that I try to practice is, wait a minute, that's a strength. You belong to a network. Why don't we tap into that network? Why don't we bring the family in teaching science? Why don't we talk to the familia and, 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 and have them understand how neurons encode information in Spanglish by utilizing tattoos, by utilizing low riders as examples of frequency. Frequency is a very, concept, a very important concept of neurons. 
By the way, everything that I'm describing is from Tara Yosu's work. I would also say that there's a lot of barriers and solutions that talk about cultural change, such as hardware, such as software, uh, such as this idea of inclusive pedagogies. You know, what does that mean? That there's different ways to teach. Oh, wow, what a, what a concept. There's a lot of individuals that are probably on this call that have done a lot of ex extensive work on training mentors and, 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 um, and, and giving us an ability to connect with students better in the classroom. And what does that mean in the classroom? In my field, structure is tightly connected to function. And so uh, I would argue that the array of a classroom, the way that we see it, the way that we uh, learn a topic, uh, oftentimes, not all of us, and we know this from neuroscience, there's different learners. There's visual learners. There's people that memorize things on paper. There's, you know, there's all sorts of ways that individuals learn. We've known this for years. So let's put it to practice. What happens when you don't have access to a lab? Can you do perhaps research in a classroom? Maybe a course undergraduate research experience. Maybe a way to, to, to do different ways. You know, maybe by doing outreach, we can ask questions. Maybe developing of preps. In my field, a prep is it's an organism that you're recording from. So for example, I've been showing you equipment uh, and I utilize this equipment for the most part to record from cockroaches. But not everybody likes cockroaches. And in fact, I was talking to Judy earlier and I was telling him that some of the most tattooed Chicanos that I have met are terrified of roaches. And so we need to envision different ways to, to connect, to engage individuals that are accessible, that are not elite, that are more inclusive, even in the approach of doing the science, I would argue, which in neurophysiology is very invasive. And in many cultures, that's a disrespect to the creation. I would also say that the outreach has to be active. And I'm not going to belabor on that, but I'll be more than happy to take questions about that. Uh, but this idea of inclusive scholarship, this idea that we can, excuse me, we can actually uh, generate questions based on the work that we do. So now, now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and just to show you that I am a faculty director. I have a big responsibility. I have a lot of students in the program of neuroscience and cognitive science. This is uh, just a snapshot that shows you the number of students as a function of time, semester by semester, uh, just to show you the, the, the growth of this program on this campus. Uh, it's, it's not one of the largest uh, uh, programs in science. There's, there's other programs that are even more populated, like computer science, for instance. But it's definitely one of the largest science programs, definitely. Uh, not only that, but uh, we actually have a really interesting demographic in our program. And so to me as faculty director that I'm interested in retention, that I'm interested in recruitment, I'm very interested in using this as a laboratory, as a science education laboratory. And so a lot of the things that I look at practices, things that I do are all with the lens of how could we engage students better? How could we get them excited about science, about neurophysiology, about neuroanatomy, about neurochemistry? I can tell you that many students have an interest in this. I come from community where addiction is a big problem. Other diseases are a big problem. And so there's, there's, a, there's a, a immediately arrears in our eyes, uh, they're like antennas when we start hearing about certain topics that are very relevant to our familia. Not only that, but uh, one could also argue that, well, wait a minute, we can even change the culture of research and what does it mean to do research and, and, and give opportunities to students uh, to enroll in research. You know, I talked about cues earlier, the course undergraduate research experience, that, that is an amazing way to get students involved in research. And I believe that this idea of inclusive scholarship is to sort of normalize the view that that's an acceptable way to do research at an R1 institution. That's an HSI. It doesn't have to be just from faculty. 
could be from advisors, right? The institution that I came from before, Northern New Mexico College, uh, we were we were so small that we were the faculty, we were the advisors. On this campus, there's a differentiation, faculty, advisors. Now I'm gonna to talk to you about some of the things that I'm very passionate about, which is retention. And I talked about that in, in my first slide. So what you're seeing here is a cohort of 2019, and just bear with me here, uh, this graph that you're seeing has a percentage bar graphs. The, the bar graph to the farthest right where the mouse is shows you the total number of students that came into campus to, that, to our program in 2019. So 153 students. If you take and you ask the question of what happens to these 153 students a year later, and you come back and you ask that question and you say, how many have we retained? Which is the bar column to the left. 65, uh, 100 students were retained, 65% of them. Wow. When I first saw this, I couldn't believe it. I had to redo this. So what happens to the ones that are not being retained? That's the next bar graph to the left. Some of them are not enrolled, 14% of them. 20% of them changed the major. What did they change to? Physiology, pre-nursing, pre-psychology, pre-business. I mean, look, they're still in college. I'm happy. But from a retention perspective, as a faculty director, I want to know why. Why did they change their major? Do they sometimes feel as unwelcome as I feel, I wonder? Are they being treated in the same way that sometimes I get treated? I wonder. So to me, these are important questions. Not to point fingers, but these are important questions. And even more interesting is when you start taking a look at some of the demographics of some of the individuals that are not being retained. So in the cohort of 2019, 34% of the students were not retained. There's a common denominator here. Very few, if at all, outreach experience, research experience. The demographic is, unfortunately, what you would expect. What about 2020? It's a different year. Looks identical, doesn't it? Different numbers, different year, different students. Same picture. Same picture, right? So. The year before, oops, the year before, 34%. The year later, which is what, 2020, 33%. So, you know, I, these are the kinds of things that I'll be very honest with you, keep me up at night. How do I engage more students when we don't have black space, when we don't have, there's a lot of limitations. Lot of, and by the way, we're not unique. Many institutions have the same limitations of space, of resources, even though this is an R1. Now, I want you to think about some of the solutions that I have thought about for many years. Whenever I'm not sleeping or whenever I'm running, early exposure, many people would argue. I've already talked about course undergraduate research experiences, active learning problem-oriented learning, problem-based learning, freight and pedagogy. This concept of higher order skills that sometimes is referred to as Bloom taxonomy. And I just want to say that I don't necessarily disagree with that. I agree with the concept, but I do want to be respectful that that's actually comes from indigenous community circle practices. So I want to be conscientious of that. The idea of taking a step back and having a big picture. That's not necessarily a Bloom's taxonomy concept. That's my point. Collaboration. I just came from an amazing training in diversity uh, brains, big shout out to the brains family, where collaboration is fostered. Sometimes in the, in the field that I'm in, you're not encouraged to collaborate. You're encouraged to be independent. 
to prove that, that you can that, that you really master the skill. It's like, well, wait a minute. Just because you collaborate, that doesn't mean that you cannot master the skill, right? What about this idea of the peer mentor model, which is not a deficit-based model? I'll talk about that in more detail. There's a lot of ways to engage students through undergraduate research, lots of ways. You don't necessarily need a laboratory to engage students in undergraduate research. There's even programs that that very successful from the Department of Energy that unfortunately were cut because of, of you know, budget constraints. And oftentimes the first programs that go are diversity programs. Argonne National Laboratory is the only national laboratory in the country that written in the mission statement is education. Argonne National Laboratory had an unbelievable program where they take a collaborative team, a community team of faculty and students to go and do a summer program together. Very successful program. I have an experience in that in the field of nanotechnology that resulted in a publication in a very prestigious journal in chemistry that even my own professors told me I haven't even published in that. So how did that happen? Right? And of course, this, uh, uh, I shouldn't say of course, you know, these ideas of student organizations and community to foster this community of wealth, uh, like SACNAS chapters, like ACES, you know, big shout out to the SACNAS and ACES, and there's many other, many other, uh, uh, the ASEMS program here, for instance, right? It's a beautiful example of community, of network, of working with each other, lifting each other up. By the way, this actually leads to inclusive scholarship research questions. And so in my mind, as I think about all of these things, and in, in the way that I, I'm constantly reinventing myself to accept the way that I am in my culture, in my identity, how could I deploy as an educator, as a faculty member, as a scientist, as a student of neuroscience? How could I bring all of this to the table in order to really get more involvement from students? Myself as a student, I also think of myself as a student. How can education be structured in which we can promote retention of traditionally underserved students? Whatever that means for you. This idea of individuals that have been excluded from this conversation comes to mind. What are some of the practices that are effective, that are not based on deficit-based interventions? Because like David Asai would say, we already know that those interventions are not moving the needle at the national level. This is an example of a program that I have created here at the University of Arizona, which is called Neuron. And I'm really sorry to say that uh, Dr. Justin Septas, who recently passed away, was a collaborator in this project, the chair of neurosurgery here. And uh, Dr. Septas and I uh, were working on this idea of neuron, the neuron program, the neuroscience education in undergraduate research outreach and network. And the reason that I'm showing you this uh, is just to show you that it really takes a village. This is a bottom-up approach. This is a grassroots effort. This is not a mandate from the provost office. This is literally building relationships on the ground, on the street with individuals, not presenting myself as Dr. Ricoy. This has been a huge body of work that has led even to publications. And so the, 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 to, to be able to connect with Tucson Magnet High School with Sunnyside, hopefully with Choya in the future, here in Tucson, El Paso, Española, Nuevo México, Taos, Mesa Verde, Cimarron, El pa I mean, many examples, okay? This is one example, right? But at the end of the day, I'm putting here that the critical outcome is community and trust. Because if you come from a population where I come from, we don't really trust anybody. Now, let me just, before I go to this slide, this is the neural program in which we are building first year students, first year students at this university that are traditionally would not be the rising stars of the program on paper, 
academically speaking, by GPA metrics, by looking at perhaps where they place in math, where they place in chemistry. Some even individuals would say they shouldn't even be on campus. I actually differ from that view. I say we want those on campus. Those are the ones I want. And those are going to be mentors. So this idea of the peer mentor model is, is a concept that, that I embraced that actually originates from the prison system. And it's giving individuals an opportunity, a second chance. That's referred to grace in the spiritual world. I believe that we should be graceful, kind, loving. I'm not saying that I am all the time. People that know me can attest to this, but I try to practice those principles in all of my affairs. And by doing that kind of work, individuals that, I mean, it's, it's interesting how sometimes when you ask an individual, hey, we want you to be a mentor, the, the, the person immediately turns, turn, turns, her, turns to their behind, they're thinking that you're talking to somebody else. They have never been trusted this huge responsibility that in, in traditional indigenous cultures, it, it, it happens all the time. And so all of a sudden, individuals rise to the occasion. Oh, wait, you, you want me? Really? You know, my imposter syndrome is so pronounced sometimes that even I experience this. So now we take these students, these Fergie students that are mentors, and we connect them with their peers, at maybe at Sunnyside, maybe at Tucson Magnet. We build this community, this mentoring community. I'm not reinventing the wheel at all, but I am talking about the work that I've been doing. And it's interesting that in one year, you know, I don't know if this is an outlier or not, but we're going to find out. The retention rate dropped by 10%. That's exciting for me. I'm optimistic when I see this data. We submitted this for publication to the Journal of Undergraduate Neuroscience Education, it's called June. And uh, it, you know, the, probably the most remarkable thing that I want to highlight is it's this graph on the left here. You know, we have done uh, workshops uh, uh, starting in Española, in El Paso. Uh, all the way to Colorado, even you know, San Luis Valle, Trinidad, uh, you know, areas of the country that are extremely remote, uh, that many individuals may know, uh, beautiful places, but also very uh, marginalized places. And we've also done work here at Arizona, in Tucson, and working with Tucson Magnet and Sunnyside. And interestingly, when you take a look at these data in aggregate, the results are just striking. We, we have surveyed, uh, now it's more than 200 students. So a lot of the work that I do in both students, the IRB, you know, Institutional Review Board, you know, which I had never submitted when I was a neuroscientist in the sense of my basic training, you know, basic neuroscience. Uh, but now I look at attitudes towards science. Uh, I'm not inventing these prompts. I mean, there's a whole body of literature that discusses this sense of belonging, science identity, you know, whether, how, I, how, do, how do I identify when I hear science intimidates me, math intimidates me. I see an equation on the board and I run away like the plague. I see a calculation and I don't know how to do it. And even worse, I'm afraid to say, I don't know how to do it. I think that a lot of these concepts that, I, that, we're, that I'm talking about here, uh, there's a lot of examples, not just me, of individuals that are doing remarkable work on this framework. Uh, but also, also, the work that I do as a neuroscientist also leads to regional research in neuroscience. So it's not just the science education. It's not just as, 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 as you know, perhaps in my mind, sometimes I feel like people think that maybe I'm just playing with toys. You could actually do and ask really important questions. Some of these questions that I'm asking here, such as, for instance, can, can, in, can invertebrates learn the way we learn? Associative learning, for instance. Do cockroaches have individuality, for instance? You probably are thinking that I'm on drugs by asking these questions. 
And let me tell you that these are concepts, these are questions that have been asked primarily by Charles Turner, who is a black scientist that not many people know, and was actually resurfaced by the Black Lives Matter movement, unfortunately, or fortunately, whichever way you want to look at it. I would argue that cockroaches can be used as a model to study addiction. And I'm going to show you how. And I, also, I would also show you how invertebrates can be used uh, in a classroom, not in a lab, and actually really in these students. I'm going to show you also that not everything that we do is invasive. Not everything that we do requires a dissection. And that's very important in indigenous communities. Right, so a lot of the work that we have done has been uh, in communities like uh, Lakota communities in Mezcalero of Southern New Mexico, Tegua Pueblos of the eight Northern Pueblos in Northern New Mexico. Uh, and, you know, this idea of observing, this is an individual by the name of Peter Witt that in the 1940s and 1950s observed spider web orbs, orb spiders, how they create a funnel web. A spider web, and actually taking a look at the spider web as what is referred in my field as the ethogram. In other words, a graph of the behavior. Typically, when people that study behavior construct graphs that depict behavior. But what a better way than to study the web itself? That's the graph. Natural observation, as my Mescalero Lakota uh, mentor would say. This is Charles Turner. Let me introduce you to Charles Turner. Charles Turner received his PhD from the University of Chicago in 1910. He was not hired by the University of Chicago because of the color of his race. The first black individual in this country to publish in Science Journal magazine, one of the most prestigious journals of this country. And Charles Turner asked and performed experiments as a high school teacher in St. Louis, Missouri, after he was denied, hired at University of Chicago. Ironically, where he published some of this work was the Biological Bulletin, which is the official marine biological publication journal by the University of Chicago Press. And Charles Turner was asking questions of individuality. Charles Turner was asking questions about associative learning in roaches as early as 1900s. And so to me, this is just remarkable, and a remarkable example and inspiration of somebody that talk about, talk about cultural wealth, huh? My goodness. So we have done that, right? We, we have done work with uh, cockroaches uh, in the lab. Uh, these are four co cockroaches that we have worked with in the past. Uh, North American here with the long antenna, those are the ones that run really fast and you probably have stepped on or tried to step on. Uh, right on the top of that is the Madagascar kissing roach, which is my by far my favorite because I can actually hold them in my hand and I'm not scared of them. Uh, this is the, uh, the lobster roach. Uh, but those, uh, I actually don't, I now don't work with the North American roaches and I, I prefer to only work with the kissing roach. And here to the right, bottom right is the South American roach. And so we have worked uh, in the lab with students from Northern New Mexico. I have taught your courses, many of them, and have actually have a lot of the data that I'm gonna show you has been published in some form or another by <laughs> undergraduates, not in a laboratory. So here it is. I'm gonna show you what the types of questions that we examine. We have built apparatuses that are designed after rodent apparatuses to study addiction, for instance, to study the way that you learn where you get the drug, and that's important. And so there's all of these apparatuses that are built in, that you could manipulate to try to understand why an organism may be in one side versus the other. And so I'm gonna show you a video because a video is just a lot better than, than a graph sometimes. So this is a South American roach that's running around just for the video that has been trained. And as soon as it remembers where it received vanilla, which is right about now, it just sits there. 
just sits there. And, 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 and it doesn't just sit there. It sits there and it's literally, if, if you actually zoom in, you could see the antenna that's, that's literally, it, it's like trying to, to try to look for those molecules. It remembers that that is the location where it received vanilla. And so we ask these kinds of questions to study natural reward, to study drug addiction. And all of this is with students, high school students, undergraduates. And all of a sudden, you know, the, 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 they're empowered, you know, they're, they're doing experiments that they can present at a SACNAS conference, even at a SFN, Society for Neuroscience conference, which has happened in the past. What an amazing way to empower your confidence. To go to a conference where you terrify 40,000 people and, and, and as scary as it is, you show up. This is just a graph just to show you that, uh, and, and just bear with me here, but what we're looking at here is a very common form to show what is referred to as preference. So the positive value numbers that you see here are positive preferences, which are indicative of a, of a positive preference to a substance. And so you could see on this graph that the two groups that have a positive preference, it's vanilla and vanilla with ethanol. And how did I come about vanilla and vanilla with ethanol? Well, vanilla extract, it's not easy to find that's not diluted in ethanol, okay? And there's a whole science behind all of this explanation. I would argue that why, why prevent students that don't have a GPA to do these experiments. Well, why don't we flip that around? Why, why don't we connect them with this work and then worry about how they learn the textbook? You know, maybe, maybe, maybe we need to think differently as to how we're exposing the, 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 the work that we're doing in the classroom. It starts with empirical observation. Even the science process tells us about that, but we forget that. We forget about empirical observations of the natural world. And so to me, uh, I would argue that here's another video done by, by undergrads, right? Now, this is, the, this is the, the example of the grooming behavior. You're gonna see how this is a North American roach that you could see is utilizing its, its large mandibles to clean itself. And right now it's grabbing the antenna and it's cleaning the antenna constantly cleaning the antenna because that's where the receptors are. There's a lot of receptors there for molecules that are in the air. It's a huge window to the nervous system of the roach, a huge antenna to the world. This is grooming behavior. Grooming behavior can be quantified. Old school, right? You do a video, you have undergrads, you design experiments, you look at the videos, you ask questions such as, huh, I wonder how many times they're cleaning the antenna. And why is that important? I wonder how many times they're cleaning the bases, the forelegs, and why is that important? And notice that I put an asterisk right here between session one and session two. That's actually what I refer to as novelty with cockroaches. In other words, cockroaches come in into these apparatus that they have never seen, and the antennas are just going crazy because they wanna, it's like a baby exploring a toy or exploring a room. But then the second time that they have seen the toy, it's not as exciting anymore. It's not as salient anymore. In, in neuroscience, that's referred to as novelty. And in the vertebrate world, the hippocampus is very responsible for that. Not only that, but if you come from the type of place where I come from, you're not going to have access to the picture here on the left. A microscope, we call this, in my field, we call this a rig, right? A rig. It's very well known, right? And people are proud of the rig. And lots of work and lots of pain into controlling electrical noise, into controlling the temperature, into controlling the visualization, into and so this is a picture when I was in Oregon. I was doing my postdoc of my rig. Well, I would argue that, well, that's not very, uh, you know, we're not, you know, not everybody has access to this. I mean, seriously, I mean, I mean, this is great. I, I don't get me wrong. I would love to have a rig. 
See, I, I'm not against rigs. I, I, I love rigs. I love rigs, but but not everybody has this. And, and so, but 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 this is a little bit more accessible right here. This is a little amplifier, right? I'm I'm gonna turn it on. It just sounds like an old TV, doesn't it? Well, you could actually use this. And, and you know, he showed you we use sound to hear neurons. And if you have ever done an experiment when you hear a neuron, everybody stops what they're doing. Everybody goes, Great, come over here, take a look, you know, an electric fish, a cockroach, a crab, a leech. Right? So exciting. Whether you're in Woods Hole or whether you're in Espanola, New Mexico. Not only that, but we could actually, we could actually get out of our comfort zone and learn coding and learn ways to look at this data. Because at, at the end of the day, these are audio files, right? So you know, people have done this before, right? So we submitted this for publication and, and got accepted and published it in which we are now Investigators in a full blown lab. We have a we have a rig. We have an organism. We have neurons. We're asking important questions such as the firing rate. In other words, how fast these neurons are firing, which is a very common question in neurophysiology. We, we, we want to know what is the overall population of these neurons firing, so we can build histograms the number of events, and even categorize them as a function of their firing rate, right? Whether you're in Espanola, whether you're in Woods Hole, I would argue. And then you have individuals that just blow you away. In the words of Dr. Joe Martinez, he said, it's like the great boxers. Every now and then one comes every 10 years, every 15 years, and just blows you away. This is a dissection done by an individual that blew me away, by the name of Andres Romero. And you can see how he's air puffing of a disposable glass pasture pipette. He's puffing air into the cerci, which is the appendage that you see in the rear, which by the way, the cerci are loaded with receptors. And you probably didn't know this, but now you will. You could impress uh, your date next time by asking them, do you know what has the fastest escape response Escape response on land? And they may say, well, no, I don't know. And you could say, well, uh, number one is the dung beetle. Number two is the cockroach. And it's primarily attributed to the escape response that's being mediated by this organ, which is called the circle system. So you could do some really elegant work by recording and even doing pharmacology actually. You know, this ability to apply drugs and then, and then control, as you could see here on the left, you know, what we're looking at here on the left, the red, the red uh, trace here that you see here. Uh, well, first let me show you what we're looking at an image, like a zoom image. He actually built electrodes and there is built electrodes that are glass with, with a little pin. He sanded paper clips, stainless steel, glued. I mean, this is all do it yourself. This is all being creative, being ingenious. And what you see here is the ventral nerve cord. That's the equivalent of your spinal cord. That he's essentially lifting with two little pin metals, making an electrical connection and recording extracellularly. We can see that when we apply air and the air is the blue trace, which he's recording, right? I mean, Andres is a scientist. This is before he went to Woods Hole as a course assistant. Andres now works as a consultant in Sandia National Laboratories. They were impressed that a kid from Española, New Mexico had gone to Woods Hole. 
And there he is himself. There is Andres Romero. Andres Romero is right here on the right. Uh, an individual that uh, the system never gave him the opportunity. And I have learned more from him than I have learned from textbooks. Let me tell you that. And Andres Romero built, among many of the things that he did, he built another device because let me just tell you, Andres Romero, although he showed you, I just showed you a cockroach dissection, Andres Romero was terrified of cockroaches. Terrified. You know, this guy, you see him and, you know, a lot of tattoos and stuff and very strong guy. Terrified of roaches. So he said, Dr. Rico, I cannot work with roaches, but I want to work with this earthworm. And the reason that I want to work with this earthworm is because I read this paper and he started telling me about this. And I was just sitting there just like a kid in Disneyland. You know, just like, wow, you know, like just admiring what he was doing. And he talk about artisan, an individual that had worked with law writers, with Adobe construction, as a tattoo artist. That's, I mean, my God. Hands on, this guy, I have never seen anyone like him. Look at this device that he built in which he essentially coupled a speaker that vibrates at specific frequencies that are relevant, relevant to the predator, the mole that stomps on the ground eliciting vibrations on the surface, right? And the, the, the earthworms that come up. I mean, the, 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 the scientist that has done those experiments is a scientist that's very well known from Vanderbilt University, Dr. Ken Catania. And here it is, Andres, that, that, you know, he read this paper and was like, my goodness, right? Ulysses, we have about a minute left. All right. I, I, so okay. I'm going to, you know, I'm very passionate, but let I me. I know it's so exciting. I want to just show you this. Okay. And I want to, Kimberly Sierra Cajas does have one question. Please. So I want to make sure we can get to her question Please. too before we all have to yes. log off. Go ahead, Kimberly. I, I don't know if my mic is working well, but um, my question was, I know that there are high school programs um, and classes around Tucson that are engaging students in research. And you mentioned Tucson High. That's one of the schools I was thinking of. Um, are there neuroscience students who are involved in outreach and are, are or could be presenting to some of those um, high school classes to talk about you know, neuroscience? Yes. Um, yeah, OK. Yeah, no, the, no there, there are, there are, Kimberly, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, look, if, if you know of, of other people that are doing this work, uh, by all means, I would be very interested. Uh, I've only been on this campus a little bit uh, greater than three years, uh, and some of the work that we have done has been, uh, for instance, with SARSIF, right? Uh, so the, uh, absolutely, I mean, the, the, the connections that I have made have been through the grapevine. You know, Margaret Wilch has been an amazing resource. Uh, she's the one that introduced me to Jeremy Jonas at Tucson Magnet. Uh, it was also through them, by the way, that I met uh, Cindy Buhanda, uh, who is an instructor at Sunnyside. Uh, uh, but I, I'm not uh, very familiar as in terms of other individuals that are doing this work. Uh, we are doing this work. We have done this work. Some of the clubs that are in NSES, like the NSES Association of Students, uh, a lot of these individuals participated in the neural program uh, last uh, cycle, right? Uh, I'm actually, at the moment, uh, a big shout out for any potential students, not just in neuroscience, uh, that want to be peer mentors. Uh, because we need to do a, a workshop uh, in the fall. Uh, we, in fact, we will do a workshop in the fall. Uh, and so we're still actually right now, right before this uh, presentation, I was working on ways that we could effectively do this, not just with one high school, but possibly more than one. So any leads would be very, very welcome. I um, appreciate I'll put it. Together with you separately. I have to run to another meeting, but thank you so much for your presentation. You bet. Anytime. All righty. Should I stop my, my screen so that I can look at everybody? Well, they're not gonna see me, but I'll take questions if we have time. If not, if not, you could actually uh, email me, right? Uh, my email is recoyalarizona.edu, not a problem. Happy to take questions, happy to take questions over email, 
Uh, we um, I have a, an Instagram page, it's Recoil Lab at UA. Uh, be happy to uh, hear from all of your feedback. I did not monitor the chat, Judy, so I apologize. No, that's okay. The we were monitoring, Kimberly's question was the one that came in. Um, I mean, this was incredible. The, I know that you probably could have shared for another hour because you have so much information. And I kept jotting down examples of like, oh my gosh, this is clearly community cultural wealth. This is clearly funds of knowledge and tied to students' linguistic knowledge and home knowledge and passions. And so thank you. Um, no, no, not a problem. Sharing. Um, and I'm not going to use this to impress my date. I'm going to use this to impress my six-year-old. Yeah, yeah. I, no, uh, in all seriousness, uh, I I would be more than happy to talk to your six year old. Oh, and also, uh, what school is he in? He's at Hollinger. Okay. Uh, so let but me I'll know. connect I, with you. Let me know. Uh, send me an email. Uh, if you want to connect with the teacher, feel free to do that. Uh, I, you know, I'll be very honest. Uh, uh, oftentimes, you, you will be surprised, but a lot of times, you know how these universities, it's a huge campus. And so we are all working in a, in our own little corner. We don't necessarily know uh, who's where, who's, and so absolutely, I would be Thank more you. than happy to, absolutely, uh, don't Thank hesitate. You. Well, we are Monique, so grateful. Thank you. Yeah, no, we're so grateful that you helped us kick off the webinar series for the year. Um, we're going to send you the chat because people are putting just some wonderful um, feedback for you and appreciation and, and love, which is always so nice to see. Um, for everybody who is on still, please join us on October 13th. We are going to do our very first webinar fully in Spanish um, with guest host uh, Dr. Nadia Alvarez Mejia, and she's going to be joined by some of our partners, our education partners in Sonora. So it'll be all around collaborations and transborder education initiatives. Um, we will also um, simultaneously offer English interpretation. And so please join us. Um, we'll put this link up on the website, on HSI Initiatives website, so you can see the full recording of Dr. Bacoy's presentation. Thank you again. I'm, so, I'm so glad you were able to join us. Thanks, Thank everyone. You.